seated. Well, it is an honour to be here uh, back on the Gold Coast. Of course, different venue this year. How many of you love the Sheraton? Yeah. Fantastic, hey? Apparently there's a beach down there. Uh, I live on the Gold Coast and I haven't seen it for about eight years, but um, I'm told there is, is one a little way down the road. Yeah, I didn't get a lot of time to prepare for this uh, this morning because, um, you know, when you win an award, uh, which was only announced last night, the Associate of the Year, of course, I, you know, I'd hoped that I was in the running, but of course it's never a given because there was a whole group of very eligible champions up here last night. And so it is an honour to have, have achieved that award in such uh, great company. I think for me, I just, I've, been, I've been asked to share for a few minutes on, on how this journey began and... Um, and to inspire you a little. And, and I have to give all credit to Adelaide. And uh, we just love our Adelaide friends. And, uh, and I suppose it started last year in Adelaide when the uh, convention shifted there. And it was absolutely a brilliant year. And it had been on the Gold Coast for many years. And, you know, I have uh, interesting memories of Adelaide. Um, my first memory, for those of you that don't know, was back way early in my journey with Manatech when I joined. Um, I was known as the Phantom. Nobody knew who I was. Um, I was that faceless guy that lived up here on the Gold Coast and the Sydney corporate office didn't know who I was, but they did hold a convention in Adelaide. I think it was about two years after I had joined and it was a presidential leadership meeting. So I, I jumped on a plane, went down there and um, was greeted at the airport without me realising it at the time with a cameraman and, uh, and someone to interview me. Anyway, everyone got off the plane. I went and got my, my, my bags off the, the little turn, turn, turn style there and... And everyone was gone except me, and eventually they came up to me and asked me, was I Rod Gilchrist? I said I was, and they were flabbergasted because they knew that I was a minister, and in their mind, they thought that I would either look like Charlton Heston um, and have a big long white beard, or Yul Brenner and be bald. Which in a way, I sort of have the Yul Brenner thing going on, but definitely not the Charlton Heston thing going on. And so that was my first introduction to Adelaide, and then while I was in Adelaide, I got mugged, and, uh, which was fantastic, really. Uh, you haven't lived life till you've been mugged in Adelaide, and trust me. And uh, so I got mugged, and it was okay because I was actually earning an, you know, an okay income. So I was willing to, to be mugged. And it's the only time where it's okay to be mugged when you can afford to be mugged. This is the business which can provide you great future, a great future, and safety to know that you could be mugged and afford it. But, so I, I handed these guys all my money, and, uh, and they let me off lightly. The next time I was in Adelaide was when we had a flame out on our aeroplane, I was flying off to Perth where my, my mother lives and uh, we were sort of going past sort of Adelaide and there was this massive explosion in the right engine and I was sort of sitting in a position where I could see the engine and it started flaming out and so, you know, the, you know, the captain gets on and he says, I've got good news, bad news type of thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, bad news is, obviously, uh, we have a problem with our right engine. Good news is, these planes can fly on their left engine. No problem at all. We're, not, we're trained for this sort of thing. But, you know, we're going into Adelaide anyway. And so everyone around me was panicking, think they're all going to die. And I just had this big smile on my face. I was happy. I said, hey, it'll be fine. You'll be fine. And so I had like a 20, 25-minute time of holding a, a group counselling session <laughs> at 30,000 feet as we were descending into Adelaide. Unfortunately, we were descending at an acceptable rate. And... Uh, and so that was another wonderful Adelaide experience. And of course, last year, uh, when I was there for the third time, uh, I, I had a, uh, we had a wonderful convention. And then after the convention, uh, we were being picked up by a limo to go back to the hotel. And um, the limo was obviously carrying somebody else. So I just decided I'd just go jump on the tram, got on the tram, and it just so happened the football had just finished. So it got crowded with about 5,000 soccer fans uh, in a matter of minutes. So here I am standing, you know, dressed in a suit, um, in the middle of this tram with all these smelly soccer players who were all still yelling at each other and, and, and speaking out colourful metaphors and expletives. And uh, I was holding an award, which I won last year, which was for the top income earner. So I've got this big, dirty old, you know, award in my hand and I'm standing there very vulnerable and uh, all these smelly, stinky, half-drunk people uh, asked me, one of them said, oh, what's that for? And, and I was sort of really reluctant to say that I just won the top income earners because I just had a flashback to being mugged the first time <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to have to empty my pockets again and get mugged a second time on the plane, but uh, on the train. So, so in my mind, uh, that, was, that was there. But, you know, it is, and it is an honour to win that award, trust me. Uh, being in this business does afford you uh, a lifestyle that you probably couldn't get doing anything else. And, and so I'm very grateful for the compensation plan and how it rewards us. For all the new people, you've got something to look forward to. And for the rest of us that are benefiting from that, we're all very thankful. And, uh, but 
last year at Adelaide, I did something a little bold. And as they say, if you just keep doing the same things over and over and over again, you'll just keep getting the same results. So you need to do something different. And so I, I have a belief that if you want to get anywhere in life, you have to follow. I call it my 3D model. Uh, it's very simple. You have to, number one, you have to decide that you want something different. So D1 is to decide, make a decision that you just don't want to stay the way you are and you want to be something different or do something different. Number two is to decree it. To decree uh, in the dictionary means to speak something as uh, with authority, like a king would decree an edict or a queen would, 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 de would depict an, uh, you know, a, an edict. So it means to decree. It means to say something bold and to say it like you mean it. And, and it's something that's probably even bigger than what you, you know, at that point, feel like you can even do. But you decree it. And you, you think something big and then you decree it out loud. And then the third thing is after you've decided to do something, you, you decree a thing, then you have to go and declare it every day. You have to live it and you have to have your confession in line with what you have decreed. So last year in Adelaide, when I was uh, receiving the award, I thought the best way to motivate me is to set myself up into a situation for public humiliation. And I do that every week as a pastor when I get up and speak. And uh, I'm joking. Um, and so, so, you know, to set yourself up to a point where you actually say something that stimulates you to action. And so I, I said last year that what I wanted to do this year at ACON was to, to be on a list or win an award or, or, or do something or achieve something other than just winning. Now, I don't mind winning, winning the business, the, um, the top income earner again. I don't, don't mind that, and that's great, because, again, you can get mugged, you know, five, six times a week, and you can afford it. But it's, it's that thought of, of doing something that you've not done before or for a long time. And so I made that decree. And then once you've made that decree, and I decreed that, and then, now, now you've gone out there and you've been all loud and rowdy at the top of your voice, right? So you stand to be wrong, you know, really loudly. Uh, but at the same time, it's also a motivator. And I think some of us, we sort of sit back in our comfort zones and maybe you have done something great. Maybe you were a once great leader or you did once have a great business. And I didn't want to be known or remembered or I didn't even want to look at myself as Rod Gilchrist, the guy that once did it. Uh, he went presidential in four business periods, you know, went platinum, you know, in a few years one international business builder of the year, but that was like a decade ago. And as good as that is, and as rewarding as that continues to be in my life, I didn't want to just be remembered as a has-been. I didn't want to be remembered as someone that just did it. I think of that uh, movie, one of my favourites, The Three Amigos. Uh, we all know the movie, it's hilarious. It's got uh, Steve Martin, uh, Chevy Chase and Martin Short. And uh, of course, in this movie, these three amigos who are... Well, let's just say, not very good actors. And, uh, and so they're sort of doing silent movies and they get invited, after they get kicked out of being part of their studio, they get invited to go down via letter to go and fight the infamous El Guapo. We all know, so they do the, you know, thing. <laughs> Shouldn't have done that, but I'm not in church, that's okay. So, uh, <clears throat> see my son's preaching in church today. Uh, which is a proud achievement. My, my son, who's 25, is Cheryl and I, so proud parents. From the time he was a little boy, he always said, I want to be a drummer and I want to be a pastor. And uh, so while I'm here right now, he's at, he's at church preaching, which is, again, he's living his dream. So, so you know, they, they read this. Oh, and, and they got excited. It's like, we have been invited, and, and, you know, to go. And, and the way it was written was to go fight the infamous El Guapo. And Steve Martin reads it, he goes, we have to go fight the infamous El Guapo. Infamous El Guapo. Who can be more famous than us? We are famous. He is infamous. And so in his mind, he wanted to go out there and be more famous than the infamous El Guapo. Little did he know when he got there that infamous meant infamous and not just infamous. So I suppose the moral of the story is, you know, are you infamous? Um, I'd rather be infamous than the infamous. I would rather be a person who is in the moment, living the moment, doing the moment, and, and, and achieving today. And, and I think also, as an encouragement to all the new people, I personally believe Manatech's never been in better shape. I love where we're at. I love the direction of where the company's going. And, and I think there are just so many things that are positioned and aligned so well. 
And then we have for those of us that have been around for a little while, little, little, you know, guys like myself, and uh, since 1999. And, and, you know, I just want to encourage you right at the outset of this conference, don't see yourself as a has-been. Don't see yourself as a somebody who once did it. Uh, don't look back and think, hey, you know, I, I had this, but now I, I don't, or, or things aren't what they used to be. Don't do that. I set myself a goal to, 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 to really to win this award, but, but I set the goal for a couple of reasons. One, I needed it. I, I needed, again, to believe in myself and push myself. And, and, and so, you know, I needed it for me. I needed it for, for my own dignity to, to, to not, because I didn't want to be, I has been, I wanted to be, you know, a, 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 an is, not a what is or a, or a was is, but to be an is. And, and I want it to be an encouragement to all of you here today that it can be done. And uh, if you work hard and if you build teams and, you, you know, you work together and, and you just care about people, then, then those results come. And so for me, it's very exciting. And I know for a lot of people, we tend to live life just by what we see, by what we see in front of us. So we analyze where we're at based upon the facts that we have. Now, my background science, so, you know, you tend to analyze the data that's before you and then you make a tentative generalization about where you're at or, or what your future holds and then you create a hypothesis in your mind about it and then you start to, to go through all the analytics and then eventually you convince yourself you're a failure or you convince yourself you can't do it or you convince yourself that you're too old or you convince yourself that it hasn't happened for so long it'll probably never happen or you convince yourself that you don't know enough or you convince yourself that you don't have the right support around you. Or you convince yourself that it's too hard. And so while you're doing all of this, you're eroding the dream that's inside your heart and you're destroying the, your, your potential. And so, you know, I've always said to people that, you know, when we're talking about 3D, we need to take a, a proper perspective of our life. Uh, I tell the story, and it's a, and when I was talking about my son Aiden before, when he was a little boy, I used to take both my boys, he and Jordan, down, and we would, we would ride those cars. We'd sit in them, and they were, had the screen, and you'd race each other. And, and my boys always used to pick camera angle number one. It's important you get this this morning because it'll help you with your perspective on the rest of the sessions. Camera angle number one when you're riding the car. So there's three cars. There's me and my two boys. Uh, Aiden and Jordan would pick camera angle number one or camera ang angle number two. Camera angle number one is where you see the car you're driving in this race from the point of the, the front bumper. So you basically see, just see the road in front of you, you don't see the cars. Camera angle number two is, the, is where you're actually sitting in the driver's seat. So you actually see the bonnet of the car and you see the wheels and you're sort of driving around the track. And so they would always pick camera angle number one and camera angle number two, and I wouldn't adjust it because I'm so competitive I'd want to beat them. So they would pick number one or number two. And I would always pick camera angle number three. Camera angle number three was driving the car from the position of being above the car, at the back of the car, so you could see the car, the whole car, the road in front of you, the car to the left of you, the car to the right of you, and a little more of the cars even behind you, so you had a better perspective. And I think in life, when we talk about deciding, we talk about decreeing something, we talk about declaring something, we need to change the perspective from which we're looking at life. If we're only looking at life according to what we presently see, we're driving the car from camera angle number one. I was able to beat my boys every single time. And the reason why I was able to beat them is because I could see more than they could see. I had a better perspective of what I was doing than they had. And therefore, because I could see where I was, I could also see what was happening around me. And I think in life, we need moments. All of us need moments. And this convention will be a moment where you'll get to zoom back to camera angle number three. You'll see a bigger perspective from some of the great leaders that we have here. And I've got to say, having spent a couple of days listening to, uh, to Vincent van der Linde, he's absolutely awesome. To Gary Van A, as he's affectionately known down under, because none of us can spell his last or say his last name. Uh, Gary Van A. Uh, we've got Big Al. Um, I don't know. I've never heard Big Al, but just the name alone sounds awesome. Big Al. Then we have Al Bala. So if we've got Big Al, I don't know what Al is. Al must be El Guapo. Um, he would be using the Hispanic. He would be Al Al. Uh, he would be Al Al or L squared or L to the power of two or something like that. So we have uh, some uh, brilliant speakers. And so I just want to say in closing... That zoom out, zoom out a little bit, get a bit of bigger picture, get a dream and, and work hard for it. Um, many of you know that my whole life is around dreaming. Uh, my church is called Dream Center Christian Church. My number plate on my car is dream one. My wife is dream two. Uh, my my, my oldest son's dream three. 
Um, uh, my next oldest son is Dream 4. Uh, my daughter, Courtney, got her license just over a year ago. She's Dream 5. And my youngest daughter uh, is halfway through a learner's permit, and I've already got her number plates, Dream 6. So, you know, we live around the dream. And what I choose to do is I choose to speak what I expect to happen rather than speaking what is. We need to call those things that are not as though they are. We need to call ourselves successful before we will be successful. We need to see ourselves and call ourselves blessed before we see the blessing. There's no point saying it doesn't take any faith or vision to say what is. You know, to say, oh, we suck. Well, it doesn't take any faith to say that. It takes faith and it takes leadership and it takes somebody who has made a right decision to say, you know what, I am successful. And so when you make that decree, you get up every day and you begin every day to say, today is a day it's going to be a good day. Today is a day I'm going to make progress. Today is a day that good things are going to happen. And I say to people this, if anything good's going to happen to anyone anywhere on planet Earth today, it's going to happen to me. And I think if everybody on earth said that, if something good's going to happen to anybody, you know, anywhere on planet earth that's going to happen to me, then that's awesome. And always readjust your dream. Always zoom back and dream bigger. I had my BMW 7 Series for five years, finishing the story on the number plates. And about three months ago, I decided to get rid of my BMW. My children were, were disgusted. They were like, Dad, you can't get rid of it. It's an awesome car. We love that car. It's like an icon. Had it for five years. But inside, it was like, the dream had gone from my BMW 7 Series. It was great, loved driving, it was nice. So I eventually sold the car and my dream plates are now sitting on my office desk. They're on ice and I'm driving my, uh, my mother-in-law's ex Hyundai 1998 XL. And I can get from naught to 100 in about seven minutes in that thing, trust me. <laughs> My children won't, well, my, my youngest daughter, who doesn't have a license yet, won't let me pick her up from school because um, my dream at the moment, the Hyundai XL, is her nightmare. And so Cheryl has to go pick her up in dream two. But the story and the moral behind this is I was driving the dream car for me at that time, that 7 Series BMW, but then for, for whatever reason, I, want, I wanted a bigger dream. I wanted a new dream. And it was fine to be Rod the Platinum, the rod that was, but I wanted a new dream. I wanted a new dream. So I've got my plates on ice and now I'm driving around looking at all the other cars waiting for a new dream to come into my heart. I'm waiting to think, oh, is that the car I want? Is that the car I want? Is that the one I want? And so meanwhile, while I'm driving around incredibly slowly getting a chance to look at all of these other cars, <laughs> there's this stirring inside of me about what's going to happen next. And I say to Cheryl, you know, the dream one will live on the dream will emerge and it'll be better than the last dream. But the thing is, if you stop dreaming, you stop living. You know, if you can't dream, you'll never live. So my encouragement in closing to all of you is, if I can make a comeback, you can make a comeback. And you're going to hear some amazing stuff this weekend that will empower you if you pay attention, that will help you fulfill your dreams and see everything that you desire in your heart come to pass. God bless you all. Thank you for your time.